But I want to start out, first of all, this morning by, by kind of setting things up because of what our text looks at. You know, we, in this world in which we live, and I've, I've talked to different ones of you at different periods of time, and you, you look at the events going on around us in the world, you look at the things that our news is constantly covering, and, and some of you ask the questions, where is it all going to end? Where is this leading? What, what is next? And the truth is, we are constantly reminded of all of the wrongs around us. You know, we, we read, we look at the news, we read the newspaper, we pick up uh, a magazine, and we're told about global terrorism. We see the unrest that exists on our city streets throughout this nation. We find that there are financial woes still for many trying to survive and just get ahead or, or some still trying to find a job after the recession of 2009. There are families that are divided and, and, and struggling and in crisis. And so when we look at all of this and we ask ourselves the question, what is there to rejoice about? The world I live in, you may say, there's a lot of things to complain about. There's a great deal that we just don't like. But what I want you to hear this morning, if you hear nothing else I say, is this. If you are a Christian, if you are a child of God, you have more to rejoice about than you may realize in this world. And it all focuses upon what God has done, continues to do, and will do in our lives. When everything in the, around us in the world is going awry, what I want you to remember is my focus is not to be upon all of this. My focus is to be upon Him. Paul wrote the letter to the church at Rome and he wrote several other letters as well. And it's interesting that when you began to look at these letters you find that he is often calling Christians to rejoice. For example, later here in Romans chapter 12 verse 15, Paul will make the statement, rejoice with those who rejoice. Of course, he says weep with those who weep, but rejoice with those who rejoice. If you look at his letter to the Corinthians, his second epistle, he, at the end of that letter, says, finally, brethren, rejoice. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 11. If you look at his, his letter that he writes to the Christians in Philippi, which, by the way, was written from a prison cell in Rome, Paul, time and again, calls upon them to rejoice. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 18, he says, You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. In chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. In chapter 4, verse 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, he says, rejoice always. I don't know about you, but I don't do that. Not near as much as I should. I don't rejoice always. Something breaks down at home. Something doesn't go right in the way I want it to go. I'm frustrated and I voice my frustration. I don't always rejoice. And yet I know I need to. In what Eddie just read for you a moment ago, and we're going to actually go through all the first 11 verses of this chapter, but I want you to see here in these first two verses something that Paul is doing. He has reminded them that they have been justify, justified by faith. He tells them that they have peace with God. And he also says that they have obtained what he calls an introduction by faith into God's grace. And he says that all of this is through Jesus Christ our Lord. Having said all of that, he then gives them three reasons 
that they as Christians should rejoice and should have joy in their lives. And today I hope that by the time I'm finished with this message, you will write these down or take these notes that, from the sheet that you've been given and that you will commit these three things to memory. Because when you start looking at the world around you, you will stop and say, you know, I know things aren't good in the world, but I have a reason because I'm a child of God, I'm a Christian, I have a reason to rejoice. I have three good reasons to rejoice. And it's those that I want us to focus upon this morning. The first one is this. It's exactly what Paul says here in the very beginning. In verse 2, after telling us that we've been introduced by faith into this grace in which we stand. And he ends verse 2 by saying, And exult, or we exult, in the hope of the glory of God. Another way to translate that word exult is we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. You and I have a hope as Christians. And it's not an uncertain hope. It's not like the everyday hopes that we have about the weather or about our health. Well, I hope it doesn't rain today or I hope it does rain today because my crops really need some rain. I hope this knee doesn't give out on me on the way to Nashville today. I hope this doesn't happen or I hope that does happen. It's not that type of hope at all. No, the hope of which Paul speaks here is a joyful, confident expectation that rests firmly on God's promises. And he says the object of that hope is the glory of God. It is the desire and the expectation that you and I have of seeing on that great day our God in all of his resplendent glory. It'll take away any concern you have here upon this earth. The truth is, God's glory has already been revealed. If you go to Psalm 19, verse 1, David writes there that the heavens are telling the glory of God and the expanse is declaring the work of His hands. He says, just go out and look at the sky. It tells you the glory of God. It reveals God's glory. If you look at John's Gospel, John chapter 1, you find there He introduces us to the Word made flesh. And down in verse 14, notice the words that he used. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus Christ revealed to us God's glory. Later in John chapter 17, as Jesus is praying that last prayer with his disciples before going over into the Garden of Gethsemane, leaving, before leaving the upper room, he prays there as he lifts up his eyes to heaven. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, even as you have given him authority over all flesh, that all whom you have given to him, he may give eternal life. So Jesus, through his death, burial, and resurrection, would glorify his Father. God's glory has already been revealed. It's already been made manifest. But God's ultimate glory, His complete revelation, is going to be revealed to us on that last great day. We are going to see when the curtain is raised and God in all of His glory, all of His brilliance, stands before us. Those of us who are Christians are going to be able to relish in that glory. Here's what's going to happen. The first thing that's going to happen is that Jesus is going to appear in the clouds with great power and as he says in Mark 13 verse 26, glory. The second thing that's going to happen is not only are we going to see the glory of our Lord and our Savior, but you and I as Christians are going to be changed into that glory. John wrote in 1 John chapter 3, there in verse 2, he says, we know that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. 
Or you could add to that Colossians chapter 3, verse 4. Because there, Paul makes a statement. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you will also be revealed with Him in glory. On that day, as Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, God will be glorified in His saints. You and I were created in the image and the glory of God. At least that's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7. But because of sin, we fell short of that glory. But on that day, we will be glorified with Him. Romans 8, verse 17. And then thirdly, folks, even the creation itself, which is groaning to be set free from its slavery and its corruption to sin, is going to be brought into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Revelation 8, verse 21. All of this has to do with the glory of God. And that's why Paul says we rejoice, we exult in the hope of the glory of God. We have this expectation of seeing God's glory. And there's nothing on this earth that can ever compare with that. But secondly, not only do we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, we rejoice in something that we don't generally think about rejoicing in. Paul says that we also rejoice in our tribulations. If you'll notice the very next verse here in Romans 5, verse 3, he says, not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Paul says, we don't just rejoice in this hope of God's glory. We are also rejoicing in the tribulation, our tribulation. What's he talking about? When he says tribulation, he's not talking about the trials and the tribulations of daily life that we so often experience. He is not talking about our aches and pains. He's not talking about our fears and our frustrations. He's not talking about here about our deprivations and our disappointments in life. Know what he is talking about when he says that we rejoice in our tribulations. He's talking about the opposition that we face, the persecution that we may face from a hostile world. Now, brethren, we have been privileged to live in a nation in which we have not experienced that, at least not to the extent that we see going on around us in other nations. None of us know what it's like to have our children taken and removed from us by a terrorist group because we're Christians. None of us know the experience of having our church destroyed, this building, our church, we are the church, this building destroyed because we worship Christ and we honor Him. We don't experience those things. Those are going on in other countries. Church buildings being bulldozed down, being blown up, children being carried away by different terrorist groups because they are Christians or their parents are Christians or even taken out beside a seaside and beheaded for their faith. We don't experience that. But the opposition and the persecution from the world is what Paul is talking about. It's the same tribulation that Jesus was speaking of at the Last Supper there in John chapter 16 and verse 33 where he says, In the world you have tribulation, but take courage, for I have overcome the world. It's the same tribulation that Paul was speaking about in Acts chapter 14, verse 22, whereas he and Barnabas are going back through the churches that they have established on their first missionary journey, and they are saying to those Christians in those churches, those congregations, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. It's that type of tribulation. But why would we, why would we want to rejoice in tribulation? Here's two reasons. We rejoice in tribulation, first of all, because our suffering leads to maturity it is productive but it's productive only if we respond to it in a positive way let me let me share with you what he says this list again 
tribulation produces what? Perseverance. Perseverance produces what? Proven character. Proven character produces what? Hope. And he says that hope doesn't disappoint. Well, what do you mean, Paul? It doesn't disappoint because suffering also, the second aspect of that, suffering also results in God's love in us. God's love being poured out in us. Notice that again. He says here, hope does not disappoint, verse 5, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The Holy Spirit is God's gift to all believers upon their conversion. At the point that we are baptized, that we come into the body of Christ, God gives to us His Holy Spirit. That was Peter's affirmation there at the, the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, where he tells them, Repent, let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's God's gift. Or, if you'll notice also what we find in Titus chapter 3, Paul's statement there, verse 5, he tells us that he, God, saved us not on the basis of deeds or works which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. It plays an important part. But one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is what Paul says he does here. God's Holy Spirit pours out into your hearts and into my heart God's love. It is God's way of saying, I want to show you how much I love you. And so, yes, we rejoice in our tribulations because ultimately it causes us to grow and it causes us to know more of God's love toward us. But then there's that last point that he makes. He tells us that we're rejoicing in something else. And I want you to notice what he says here beginning in verse 6. He says, for while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. He says, for one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man some would, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own, Lord toward, his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath, the wrath of God through Him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only this, here it is, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in our tribulations, but now we rejoice in God Himself. One of the reasons that we rejoice is because of who we were. He uses four terms to describe us. He says that we were helpless. Verse 5, or excuse me, verse 6. While we were still helpless, we were powerless. We had no strength to do anything for ourselves spiritually concerning our salvation. We were without strength. Not only that, he tells us that we were ungodly. Verse 6, end of the, the verse. What does it mean to be ungodly? It is a word that means that you are rebellious toward God. It is a word that, me, that has as its indication whatever characteristics you would use to describe God, you're the opposite. Do you know anybody that's rebellious? You ever had a rebellious teenager? You want them to do one thing, they want to do something else. You tell them no, they're going to do it anyway. You say go do it, they're not going to. You tell them the sun's shining, they'll argue with you that there are clouds up there in the sky. You ever been rebellious toward God? He says we were rebellious, we were ungodly, we were sinners, we were people who had departed from 
that which God wants for us. Verse 8, he talks about God demonstrating his own Lord love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, we were sinners. To be a sinner means that we've departed from the way of righteousness. We have fallen from God's glory. We are individuals who have missed the target that God has set for us, the righteousness that God wants us or wants in us. None of us can measure up. None of us can equal or can attain to the glory of God outside of Christ. And then he says that we were enemies. In verse 10, for while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. We held a deep-seated hostility toward God. As a matter of fact, Paul puts it this way a little bit later in this same epistle. Over in chapter 8, verse 7 of Romans, he says, The mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God. It is not even able to do so, he said. The point he makes is that some people would try to help a righteous man. Some individuals would even try to help a good man. But ungodly sinners, those who are openly hostile toward God, no. We, we, even if we're honest with ourselves, we tend to push those people away. If I know somebody that's openly hostile toward God, I really don't want to be a part of that life. Somebody that is an ungodly sinner that wants to rebel against God. And yet, it's those very people And we are those people that God came to save. And so we rejoice in God himself. We rejoice not just because of who we were, but because of what he did for us. And it's a long list. As Paul puts it here, God demonstrated his own love toward us. It is a demonstration Everything God did for us was a demonstration of His love toward us. In the midst of our sin, in the midst of our hostility, what did He do? Well, notice verse 6. He sent His Son to die for us. In verse 9, He tells us He justified us by Christ's blood. In in the latter part of verse 9, He tells us that He saved us from His own wrath, the wrath of God through Jesus Christ. In verse 10, the first part, He tells us that He reconciled us, drew us back to Himself, through the death of his son. In the latter part of verse 10, because we have been reconciled, he says, we shall be saved by his life. God's love has poured out upon us. And God has shown us over and over again how much he loves us. He sent his son to die for us. He justified us through his son's blood. He he saved us from his wrath. He reconciled us back to himself. And ultimately, he is saving us by the very life of his son. Our Lord's resurrection is God's way of saying, I'm going to raise you. I'm going to redeem you. There's a phrase that is found throughout this chapter over and over again. In verse 1, in verse 11, in verse 17, and in verse 21. It is the phrase or some rendition thereof, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Everything that God has done is going to be done and has been done through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. That is made possible for us to see God's glory because of what Jesus has done on the cross of Calvary. The fact that we can rejoice in our tribulations because of the love of God being poured out, that's been made possible because of what Jesus Christ has done for us by dying for our sins. The fact that we can rejoice in God himself because of the love he demonstrates toward us and his reconciliation of us and the saving of us from his wrath has been done through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the means by which we are justified. He is the means by which we have peace with God. He is the means, as I've said, by which we are saved from the wrath of God. He is the means by which we've been reconciled to God. He is the means by which we have an abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, verse 17. He is the means by which, if you look at the very last verse of this chapter, that we receive eternal life. He says, So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through the righteousness to eternal life, Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus is the one that makes all of our rejoicing possible. 
without him as John would write later concerning a church one of the churches to which he was in he was instructed to write in Revelation 3 verse 17 we are even as them we are wretched miserable poor naked and blind folks in this world there is little to rejoice about unless you're a Christian if you are a child of God you have a great amount of things a great number of things in which to rejoice my question to you this morning is which will you choose do you want to continue with the world do you want to follow that pattern because you're not going to find satisfaction and contentment and peace and joy it's just not there oh you may find it for the short term but for the long term it's not there the joy you want the, the the peace that you need the contentment you seek is found in Christ Jesus and it's made possible to you by God it's through his son you have a great God who loves you who sent his son to die for you who wants you to be drawn back to himself but you have to do some things on your part you have to be willing to turn from this life that you've lived apart from God it's called repentance you have to be willing to confess his name I believe that he is the Christ I believe he is God's son I believe he is my only Savior I believe he is the only way to God and you have to be buried with him in baptism because that is where he brings you into contact with the blood of his son and washes away your sin and then live for him rejoicing every day as you're climbing a little bit higher on that heavenly way we've got a song that Ray has chosen it is to encourage you to come and to know the great reason for rejoicing that all of us have but it is your song it is an invitation for you from God to come my question this morning is will you do just that as together we stand and sing